Mario. Like I said before, the most challenging part of making this series has, ironically, been playing the games, because once you actually delve under the crust of the Mario canon, you may start to notice a fluctuation in quality that, to be polite, does not always trend in a necessarily positive direction. In light of that observation, today's episode is the one that I've had the most fun with by far. The ratio of actual video games to non-games is far more favorable than ever before, and some of my personal favorites, and possibly yours, will be making an appearance. The days of Donkey Kong ports that are next to impossible to get working are over, and the age of games that people in their early to mid-twenties love and remember is beginning. Enter the Nintendo 64. This is a console that is considered to be a little bit divisive. Many people, myself included, look at the Nintendo 64 with fond memories, remembering all the multiplayer madness in some truly magical games and the funky controller that kinda looks like a crossbow. Other people look at it and remember a console that didn't have any RPGs. It definitely had some great video games, but its third-party support was barren in contrast to the PlayStation. The cartridge format was severely limiting, not to mention expensive to mass-produce in contrast to CDs, and Sony eventually remodeled the PlayStation controllers to add thumbsticks that were significantly better than the Nintendo 64 controller. There were a lot of things going against the Nintendo 64, but people still love it. Some say it's their favorite console of all time, and I think it's a safe assumption that some of the games we will speak about today are the reason why. This is Reviewing Every Mario Game, Episode 5. And to begin, we are going to be looking at a game that I should have reviewed 700 years ago. Sometimes the console wars of the 90s are talked about as an arms race, kind of like the Cold War. If we are to reference the Cold War, then the equivalent of the space race was the 3D race. And how poetic that some of the most notable games during this time took place in space. Wipe out enemy fighters. 3D had become the main focus in the early to mid 90s with many experimental games and concepts trying to figure out how it all worked, or better yet, how it should work. Wolfenstein and Doom on the PC would be a dramatic step up, while consoles and arcades were quickly getting comfortable with the graphics technology. The hardware took a while to step up to the plate. It was often primitive and choppy and not pretty at all, but it was fascinating and showed undeniable promise that could not be ignored and with new technical advancements being made all the time, some kind of revolution was inevitable. But even as late as 1996, as computers and consoles got more powerful and smooth 3D graphics were far more feasible at the consumer level, games were still trying to figure out what 3D gaming could and should really be. And that's when a new groundbreaking 3D adventure would take the world by storm. And it was called... Quake. And then Mario 64 the next day, literally straight up the next day. When I was a little kid, we used to call this game Super 64 Mario because the 64 was placed in the corner here. It's actually kind of difficult to talk about this game today because everything worth saying has already been said, which is probably why some people today actually think outside the box and attempt to downplay Mario 64's influence by saying things like, well, the industry was already moving in that direction, so it was kind of inevitable. Maybe that's true by some metrics in the same way that it's true that the Soviets were headed in the direction of the moon, but who got there first? F***ing Mario, exactly. Super Mario 64 was one of only two launch titles for the Nintendo 64. And if we're being completely honest, that's a pretty flaccid launch lineup, especially considering the catalog of games that already established themselves on PlayStation by that point. But like any good launch title, Mario was here to make it clear what the 64 was all about. The big thing with the N64 was that it was capable of real-time 3D visuals that actually looked like something and not like extremely low-resolution origami projects. Of course, the Saturn and the PlayStation before it could already do that, but the thing that really set the N64 apart was the control stick. 
There were technically analog controllers before, like the Atari 5200, but they were nowhere near that level of quality or functionality. So for all intents and purposes, it is widely accepted that the N64 was the first to do it, because it actually worked. Until a couple of years later when they start getting loose. The stick was almost definitely an even more important innovation than the graphical improvements when it came to gaming in the third dimension. Being able to precisely move around with full 360 degree range of mobility and even lightly push the stick to walk slowly, as opposed to the standard D-pads which were limited to cardinal directions and only detect all or nothing, fundamentally changed what gaming on a console could do. Nintendo did make a lot of mistakes with the Nintendo 64, but the real lasting legacy of any major console has always been the games that came out for it. And while it's true that the N64 library was way smaller than its predecessors, some incredible evolutionary stepping stones for video games took place here, and that will remain the Nintendo 64's mark on history. To say that Mario 64 was a revolutionary game is to be an actual clown. This game is, in many ways, considered to be the very foundation of many video games today. But when I played it as a kid, I took a lot of it for granted. Fully 3D game worlds were common by the time I started playing games, so this is just what I expected a video game to be. Little did I know that it was a relatively recent technical marvel. If I really wanted to, I could have made an hour-long video on this game alone. There were a lot of experiments with 3D, Mario 64's experiment just happened to yield some of the best results, at least from a third person perspective. I'd like to reiterate that this game came out the day after Quake, which was also very revolutionary, granted it was an FPS. Perhaps Quake is the other greatest stepping stone. Imagine two uniquely groundbreaking titles coming out within a literal day of each other. That had to have been the greatest week in video game history. Playing it today with zero historical context, there is very little about it that seems special at a short glance, fun as it may be. But that's because the design paradigms that this game either introduced or just did exceptionally well, became so ubiquitous so quickly that nobody even thinks about them anymore. Game developers borrowing from Mario 64 is like anybody writing a horror setting borrowing from HP Lovecraft, speaking of Quake again, in that it's so colloquial most people don't even realize they're doing it. Half the time they're probably borrowing from something else that borrowed from something else that borrowed from something else that borrowed from Mario 64. So they could be borrowing through several different proxies without even knowing it. Almost like how remnants of the Quake engine can still be found in games today. Mario 64's engine is obviously nowhere near that ubiquitous, although they did reuse it for Ocarina of Time and I think Star Fox. From the very beginning, you can tell that the developers knew they had something special with this game. Mario's giant shiny face shows up and starts acting all goofy, and then you hit the start button, and you are brought to the file select screen, and you hear that music. It doesn't just sound happy, it sounds optimistic, like a whole new world of overwhelming discovery was just opened up, and this game was the portal. Speaking of portals, numerous developers cite this game directly as being an influence on their games and design paradigms, and Gabe Newell, shut up, the co-founder and current owner of Valve and creator of games like Half-Life, whose gold source engine is a modified Quake engine, there it is again, cites this game as a direct inspiration, going as far as to say that it convinced him that video games were art. Banjo-Kazooie, now I love me Banjo-Kazooie. The developers had a very early Banjo prototype up and running and they scrapped it the second they saw Mario 64 because they could instantly tell that their own tech was pitifully outdated before it was even finished. They pretty much realized immediately that Mario 64 was how it was going to work from then on, so they basically re started overnight and got cracking on a new engine. The GoldenEye dev team also cited Mario 64's mission structure as an inspiration for GoldenEye's non-linear mission layout where instead of just shooting guys and walking to the end, you had to complete other often elaborate and descriptive objectives beforehand. Even Dan Hauser, famous for GTA, can be quoted as saying, anyone who makes 3D games, who says they've not borrowed something from Mario or Zelda, is lying. 
and that's the power of Mario 64. It almost seemed like anyone who was developing games in the years shortly after it has a Mario 64 story, which means anybody that was inspired by their games are, by proxy, again, standing on the shoulders of the giant that is Super Mario 64, and also probably Quake. I think two of my favorite metrics for determining how good a game is are 1. How passionate is the modding scene, and 2. How passionate is the speedrunning scene. Whether the developers are super stoked on these things or not, the fact is that Mario 64 is a rock star in both of these worlds. Mario 64 speedruns are nuts, just like Quake. How many times have I mentioned Quake now? Then there's the modding community. If you've been watching my channel for a while, there's a good chance that you're here because I spoke about a Super Mario 64 ROM hack. Although the game's influences can still be felt in some way or another in the modern video game landscape, Mario 64's ongoing relevance to me is ROM hacks. There are so many mods of this game that it will make your head spin, just like Quake. Okay, confirmed. They are the same game. The way Mario 64 works, how it handles, how it functions, is incredibly fluid and versatile and because of that, it serves as a very useful groundwork for so many things beyond itself. No matter what the context is, I will never get tired of running and jumping around as 64 Mario. But let's talk about the actual game. The game is fun. As of today, I have 100%ed this game at least 7 times and have played over 900 billion ROM hacks for good measure. So what I'm trying to say is, if anybody is overqualified to review this game, it's gotta be me. Mario 64 starts out with a brief intro where you are dropped into this wide open space where you can just run around like a crazy person. Instead of dragging you through a long, tooth-pullingly slow tutorial, it just lets you run around and get a grasp of how this funky little Italian man works. I'm talking slide kick, backflip, triple jump, snap pivot, flip dick thing, backwards long jump, and the wall jump. Don't even get me started, man. Seriously, don't even get me started. If, you, if you're thinking about getting me started, stop. Don't do it. One of the most impressive aspects of Super Mario 64 is the fact that it still works well. It's one thing to make something that was revolutionary decades ago, but when that thing still feels good to play decades after the fact, that is an accomplishment. I couldn't play Wolfenstein today, but Doom? I could play that any day. Tons of revolutionary games were made during this time period, and a lot of them feel dated now, but save for a few incidental bumps in the road, Mario 64 still feels incredible to play. I'm not gonna tell you it's perfect, but I'll say this. Tomb Raider came out later the same year. Play this game on the original PlayStation for two hours. Then go play Mario 64. The most generalized complaint I have of early 3D games is that they often expect a level of precision from the player that the game itself isn't able to facilitate for a multitude of reasons. What you'll notice is that many of the innovations that were made in the third dimension over the years that have led up to where we are today, beyond Mario 64, are things that are intended to mitigate these factors. Whether it's the targeting system in Ocarina of Time, or the thing Halo does where the aiming movement slows down when you drag your cursor over an enemy while in motion, these things help the player do what they're actually trying to do in 3D space without forcing them to be an unrealistically immaculate player. Mario 64 did a lot in the name of accomplishing this, like how you can control the camera independently of the character, certain actions are automated like grabbing ledges or poles because why would you jump at a ledge if you weren't trying to grab it, and get this, when you press the A button, Mario will actually jump from time to time. Combined with level design that is usually not very punishing and has a lot of open space to run around in, it makes for a game that manages to be engaging without knocking your dick off. And that's something that still impresses me today. Super Mario 64 doesn't really have any low points where I go, ah shit, not this part again. It's just good. 
Except for this stupid ass level right near the end that's 90% standing on a magic carpet that moves at 3 millimeters an hour, but I do not care to acknowledge that level. Never saw that level, never played that level, it doesn't exist. Mario 64 only has 14 levels and 113 stars. Do not ask about level 15, do not ask about the magic carpet, that's not a thing. If you ask me, Super Mario 64 is easily in the top half of the 3D Mario series, and a lot of that is due to its non-linearity. You'll jump into a painting and select a mission, but there's nothing stopping you from pursuing something else that catches your eye. Previous Mario titles were very linear and had a very A to B design, which wasn't at all a bad thing, and it meshed well with the side-scrolling level design that Mario had already revolutionized previously. If you were lucky, some levels had secret exits and pathways that brought you elsewhere. Mario 64 took advantage of the 3D technology and did something completely different with absolute free-roaming design. Levels are not just a sprint to get to the end. They are an organic, layered plane of existence full of secrets and different pathways. Liberty, freedom, America. That, to me, is the real hook of what made Mario 64 so special. It wasn't just a 3D video game, it was a 3D world. We'll get there. Eventually. It's also a very instantaneous game that doesn't jerk you around or instruct you to death. That's not to say it's hard or anything, the game is very approachable in fact. But there's a unique element of freeform platforming and exploration that isn't there in games like Galaxy or 3D World. The game is far more open to experimentation than some of those titles. There's this mission where you're supposed to blast on top of a mushroom with a cannon, but I always shot too high or too low. But on my latest playthrough, I got a good idea. I said, wait a minute, I don't need the cannon. I can just do this. Wee! I'm still alive. Nintendo doesn't try to force your hand with Mario 64. If you can figure out how it works and how to maneuver yourself, there are puzzles that can be completely invalidated, which is probably why the game has become such a wonderland for speedrunning. Even today, there are new things I learn about the game, like how you can actually grab the Koopa shells underwater to swim faster, or how you're supposed to actually stand on the penguin in this level instead of awkwardly sidling beside it. That would have been nice to know 20 f***ing years ago. There is an undeniable magical element to the game that isn't there in a lot of the other titles. Wet Dry World, depending on how high you jump into the painting, you can actually control the water level and depending on what mission you're on, you can actually make it harder or easier. Tick Tock Clock, depending on what time it is on the actual physical clock when you enter, you can actually change the behavior of the entire level, even going as far as stopping it completely. I think this magical element added a layer of mystery to the game that has kept it alive for such a long time. The kinds of things that people say about Mario 64 and its world are kinda crazy. You got people talking about liminal spaces or how every copy of the game is personalized or how Luigi is in the game which is one of the few things that actually turned out to be kinda true. I remember as a kid I became so fixated on trying to jump into the stained glass portrait of Princess Peach on the front of the castle thinking that it would unlock some kind of super duper secret level. It didn't, but the game had a way of stoking the fires of your imagination to try things like that. Being possibly the first game of its kind, people who didn't fully understand how video games worked, which in the 90s would be most people, didn't fully compartmentalize what was and wasn't possible, and I think this contributed tremendously to the mystique of the game. And it's a kind of mystique that doesn't really exist in games anymore. Since this is a launch title for the Nintendo 64, it's kind of stupid to nitpick the graphics for things like repetitive textures and samey looking environments, but at the same time, it's bright and colorful enough to not assault your eyes, and you can tell what everything is supposed to be, you know, that's bricks, that's cement, that's, um, corkboard? Ah, uh, alright. On the other hand, when you're going from this to this, you're not really thinking about repetitive smeared textures or whatever. A lot of the levels are not designed to be actual places, they're more like vague concepts of places that have been fully designed around the gameplay, which was definitely the bigger priority. Even so, there are some evocative settings like the underwater village and the interior of the clock. 
Charles Martinet does an excellent Mario performance. Even though he's mostly relegated to guttural sounds and wahoos, they bring an energy to the character that was never there in the previous titles. Then you got the music. You never get tired of it. You got that upbeat bob -omb Battlefield music. <laughs> That atmospheric, echoey remix of the underground theme. And then Bowser starts going crazy on the organ like he thinks he's Ganondorf. And then there's Dire Dire Ducks. This song is so good that it kills people. It feels cliche and played out to call this game a masterpiece, but I mean, it is kinda good though, right? This is absolutely a masterpiece work of art that belongs in a museum and it's way better than whatever your favorite game is, especially if it's The Witcher 3. No, but seriously, this, this game is great. Whether it's the best 3D Mario or not is a matter of opinion, but if you ask me, it's number 3 at the very lowest. And there you have it. After 8 years of reviewing Mario 64 ROM hacks, I finally reviewed the actual game. And now you all know how I feel about it. And what better game to follow up one of the single most revolutionary video games ever created in history than the groundbreaking, magnificent, towering achievement that would forever change the course of video game history, Picross 2. Like Super Picross, this was a Japan exclusive, this time for the Game Boy again. Fundamentally, it's the same game, but they added a couple of new modes. I like this mode, where you actually solve four separate puzzles and they fit together into one big thing, allowing far more elaborate pictures than ever before. Every single time I pick up any version of Picross, I end up playing it for 300 straight years. There's something so engaging about seeing the picture unfold, but I already told you that the last two times I talked about Picross, so let's get moving. Alright, what's next? Uh... Welcome to Mario Kart! Mario Kart 64 is a game that I have a ton of nostalgia for and one that I cherish deeply. But it's also a game I feel didn't age as gracefully as a lot of my other favorite titles. Compared to something like 3D Mario where the games are fundamentally different enough that none of them are made completely obsolete by subsequent releases, I always felt like Mario Kart is a very incremental series by comparison. The structure and the fundamentals of every single game are largely the same, but every subsequent release, with the possible exception of Double Dash, generally tends to add things and polish what was already there, rather than fundamentally going into a different direction, which is fine, because it's racing. How do you change racing? I guess they could turn it into F-Zero, but then it would only sell three copies. Because of this, I feel that Mario Kart games by their nature do not age as gracefully, since every sequel pretty much does the same thing but at a more polished level, making the games often feel simply more dated the further you go back. And this is speaking as somebody who played Mario Kart 64 since I was two years old, you know, I have a ton of nostalgic connection to this game. As a matter of fact, it's actually one of the very first video games I can remember playing. And that may well be the reason I'm so critical of it today, because I feel an obligation to balance out my nostalgia bias. It was certainly a wonderful game for its time, and I'd definitely choose it over Super Mario Kart, but given the choice of all of them, I'm probably gonna choose 8 or Double Dash. I mean, this one doesn't even have Baby Park. But let's think back to 1996, or 7, depending on where you're from. This is a very early Nintendo 64 title that, much like Super Mario 64, is supposed to be a sales pitch. You know, this is why you buy an N64. The analog stick gives you an element of precision and fluidity that isn't there in Super Mario Kart, and the scope of the game is dramatically higher. Literally. The big thing about this game is its vertical scope. Because it's in actual 3D, you're not just going in 360 degrees, you're going in the other 360 degrees as well. 
and that's called trigonometry. There are so many slopes and ramps and hills and curves and walls that you can just jump over and cheat. The other big thing is simultaneous four player. The two player mode in Super Mario Kart is what a lot of people remember the game for, but four players is a whole new ballpark. If Super Mario 64's purpose was to legitimize the control stick, Mario Kart 64's purpose was definitely to legitimize the four controller ports. I think the four player feature was directly responsible for most people's fondest memories of the Nintendo 64. You know, it was kinda like the party console in that way. And Mario Kart was an excellent example of this. With the other consoles, you needed add-ons like multi-tap to do what the N64 already could right out of the box. Just like Mario Kart 8 today, Mario Kart 64 was often the go-to game for multiplayer and it's still a lot of fun today. The success of the Mario Kart formula would go on to inspire an entire subgenre of racing games, the Kart Racer. This genre was home to so many stupidly fun experiences like everybody's favorite, Diddy Kong Racing, and everybody's actual favorite, Chocobo GP. It also had this neat time trial mode, it's really rewarding to lab it out, racing your own ghost, looking for the imperfections in your strategy. Some courses even have staff ghosts, where the developers left behind a really good race record for you to beat, and I annihilate it instantly by using these insanely broken exploits. That's one of the funniest things about Mario Kart 64, it's got a lot of broken techniques if you know where to look, which has made it a hotbed for speedrunners just like Mario 64 did months before. The speed game scene for Mario Kart 64 is unbelievable. Summoning Salt made like 8 videos on this game alone. Some of them are just dedicated to singular courses. And yeah, the game does have a few good courses. I'm talking Chaco Mountain, Donkey Kong Mountain, Toad's Mountain, Peach Mountain with Peach's Castle from Mario 64. I remember when I was a kid, I'd always drive around the castle grounds hoping I would find some kind of super secret or even get inside. I never did, but it's still a cool detail. Graphically, you know, it's what you'd expect from an early Nintendo 64 title. The environments are all fully 3D with simple texture work, while the characters took the Donkey Kong Country approach of pre-rendering a complex matrix of 2D sprites based on highly detailed 3D models and having them animate as you play the game. This allowed them to save on processing power, which was kind of a necessity with this new and unfamiliar hardware. Mario Kart 64 was also very impressive in the sound department. On top of a great soundtrack, the characters are all voice acted and the sound effects are more clear and detailed than ever before. And the game actually uses real time audio processing effects to simulate real life sound physics like the Doppler effect. <laughs> No matter what I've said about this game in comparison to the other titles, Mario Kart 64 is still a very fun game to this day. And probably the biggest advantage it has over the newer titles is that it's a little bit less random. Today, Mario Kart is like a Mad Max movie. It's like a drag race through a deceptively deadly hellscape ruled by an evil demented RNG god that randomly starts handing out rocket launchers to everyone just for fun. It's Grand Theft Auto with slightly fewer prostitutes. Mario Kart 64 is a little more reined in by comparison, although it still has this evil rubber banding AI that you'll see in the later titles. Most of the extremely broken items and power-ups you see in the later titles do not exist in this game. You still have the triple red shells and the blue shell and the star, but they aren't as powerful as in the later titles. All of this creates a racing experience that is a little less chaotic than you might expect from modern Mario Kart, but I imagine a lot of people actually appreciate that, you know, it's a lot more pure in that respect. The coolest thing about Mario Kart 64 is that it's perhaps the first game in the series where we actually learn what Wario sounds like outside of Japan. Half of the fun of this game is playing as Wario and whenever he gets hit by something he goes wow. Like I mentioned in the previous episode, Wario's voice was completely different in Japan, yet somehow his Japanese voice is remarkably just as funny. I think my favorite part of Mario Kart 64 is the fact that if you fail a Grand Prix hard enough, the punishment is death.
Yeah, that's right. If you get anything lower than third, the game kills you in a cutscene. I remember seeing this as a kid. I was horrified. I couldn't believe it. You're gonna blow me up because I didn't race hard enough? Who made this game, Fletcher? Mario Kart 64 will always be an important game and a celebration of the party aspect of video games in spite of the areas where it feels dated. And no matter what I've said in the past, it is a wonderful video game and one that will be continued to be revisited until the end of time. Our next game is an obscure little piece of history called Mario's Net Quest. This was a browser game launched in 1997 when consumer-grade internet was still trying to find its footing. Nowadays, the act of playing a game in your browser is relatively trivial. I think there's even a hard drive article that lets you play Doom. Suffice it to say, not the case in 1997. This game was made as part of a contest to promote IBM's AS400 servers using Adobe Shockwave, which was discontinued four years ago. May it rest in peace. The game itself is extremely simple. You drag Mario around the screen with the mouse clicking on coins and stars while a very crunchy version of the underground theme from Mario 64 loops every five seconds. But don't click on the bad guys, cause you'll die. It's basically digital whack-a-mole with Mario 64 assets, and for a browser game in 1997, it's downright average. Up next, we got Mario Teaches Typing 2. Even though I already know how to type, I did not know how to run Windows 98 in a virtual environment, which this game required me to do because it's not compatible with modern operating systems. I had to learn how to create and configure a virtual Windows 98 environment just to run the game, so the developers taught me about virtual machines without even knowing it. So for my money, this game should have been called Mario Teaches Virtual Machines. I spoke about the first Mario Teaches typing all the way back in episode 3, and at a purely gameplay level, this is pretty much the same. Except they added in these new cutscenes in this wonky looking 3D Mario head who is voiced once again by Martin A. Have you seen the princess? Princess! Hmm. Not unlike Hotel Mario, this Mario head became the subject of memes and YouTube poops and yeah, it's really funny. According to interviews, Martin A actually vetoed some of the dialogue decisions in the game because he felt that what the developers had written originally was often too mean or discouraging for an educational game directed at children, with things like, Ooh, you fail, or Ooh, you're not good enough. He insisted that Mario was not the type of person who would say those things, and that it would make a lot more sense if he said something constructive and encouraging, and I think that's the mark of an actor who really understands the assignment. He wasn't there to just read lines off a piece of paper and collect a paycheck. He was there to bring Mario to life in an authentic and true way that he knew better than anyone. And even as he steps away from his most iconic role, that will be his everlasting legacy. It is worth noting that I never actually got to see these voice clips in the game because I'm way too good at the game for it to apply. I mean, I don't mean to brag, but I know my way around a keyboard. That being said, the idea of Mario saying things like, Ooh, you fail, is frankly hilarious, and I could die laughing just thinking about it. Ooh, you fail, you're no good at anything, you're gonna have to be a functioning member of society, you're gonna work at McDonald's now, for the rest of your life, you bring a shame to your entire bloodline, wahoo! Up next, we got a real treat. It's Game & Watch Gallery for the Game Boy. This being the fifth episode in the series, it's been a while since we heard the words game and 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 watch, and that is because the Game Boy pretty much made the format obsolete. The Game & Watch formula was great for a long car ride or a waiting room setting because they were very easy to pick up and play. These were simple arcade-style games with arcade-style gameplay loops and nowhere near arcade-style quality. There was definitely some entertainment value in these things, but you gotta remember, every single game was its own console, which ends up being an expensive and cumbersome dynamic. It just wasn't worth owning 17 different pieces of custom plastic to play each one. Game & Watch Gallery is a collection of four Game & Watch titles all on a single cartridge, which for that alone, it's a far better deal. The games have been brought up to the standards of a late Game Boy title, which if you haven't figured it out, 
are far higher than Game & Watch. This first entry contains four titles, those being Manhole, Fire, Octopus, and Oil Panic, all remade from the ground up with Mario characters. This collection produces far smoother gameplay and visuals than the original Game & Watch consoles were ever capable of, so it effectively brought these extremely old-school games to a much more modern standard. But just for good measure, they actually faithfully recreated the original versions of these games as well, with the original Cell animations faithfully imitated with black and white sprites. And if you ever wondered where Mr. Game & Watch got his final smash attack, well, there you go. By putting these games in a far more accessible and convenient format, it is far easier to appreciate them for what they are. And the gameplay loop of some of these games is legitimately addicting, too. The games only end when you make enough mistakes, so if you get good enough, you can try and keep games going until the ends of the earth, or you get bored, whichever comes first. There's a very real sense of rhythm and pattern recognition that gets you into a flow state. These games are designed such that they are very easy to understand, you know, Know, they lure you into a false sense of security before gradually turning up the heat until you are making split-second movements to make sure Toad doesn't fall off a cliff and break his legs. Games like this are perfect for the Game Boy, because you can pick them up for 10 minutes, go a couple rounds, and then get back to whatever it is you're actually supposed to be doing in the real world. I think in my case, the greatest thing about this game is its purpose as a preservation measure. I'm always talking about how Nintendo needs to do more to preserve their older titles that are no longer available on modern devices. Game & Watch titles above everything else are very difficult to preserve because of the unique format of their games. So in the name of preservation, I do declare this to be a good video game. I feel like Nintendo should make a giant Game & Watch collection for the Switch Online service or even fully remake the entire Mario's Game Gallery collection. I don't know how many people would actually buy it, but it'd be very cool to have. Dr. Mario BS version is a Satellaview version of Dr. Mario. This is pretty much the same as the Dr. Mario and Tetris version, but without Tetris. As seen in episode 4! I feel like they should put Dr. Mario on every single console known to man, because the game is just that addicting. So a Satellaview version was absolutely justified in my book. I mean, why not, right? Up next, it's BS Mario Paint You Show Naizo Ban, or Mario Paint for the Satella View. This is pretty much the same as the original Mario Paint, except that it actually lets you use a controller this time, which is pretty neat, especially for people who didn't have the luxury of the Super Nintendo mouse. Other than that, it's the same. But if you just love painting stuff on the Super Nintendo, this will be your favorite game. Then we have Game & Watch Gallery 2. Much like the first game, the purpose of this game is to bring back some of those classic Game & Watch titles to the Game Boy, except the games are different this time. The games this time are Parachute, Helmet, Chef, Vermin, and Donkey Kong. Like the first collection, all of these games have two versions, those being the remade version with Mario characters, and the more faithful counterparts. Game & Watch titles always had a real comical element to them, and it's really funny to see that brought into the world of actual sprites and animations. Mario and the gang are still very expressive, and it's funny to watch Peach try to keep five meals suspended in the air at once. I think for me, though, the most fun game in this collection is Helmet, where you run across a field into a door to get points while this paratrooper keeps throwing hammers at you. It's dumb, but it's funny. I mean, what kind of game is that? You walk through a door to get points? There's also Donkey Kong, which has three separate levels, which for a game like this, is actually kind of impressive. The only game that kinda sucks is Vermin, which is basically whack-a-mole, but for the most part, the gameplay loop for these games is as addicting as ever. And like the first collection, it's great to have these games in a more convenient and accessible format. The next game on the list is called 64 De Haken Tamagotchi Mina De Tamagotchi World. Guess which country this game was exclusive to? This is a Tamagotchi-themed virtual board game thing, and if you don't know what a Tamagotchi is, this was basically a digital pet thing that came on a tiny little device with a screen that you had to feed and play with and medicate on a regular basis. I actually had one of these when I was like seven. I named it Wario. Then it died in like a week. 
I didn't know this, but apparently they still make these things. That's impressive. I assumed they would have replaced it with an app or something. This board game is on the list because you can actually unlock characters that are Mario and Wario themed, but getting that to happen is really hard to do. And this is already a board game in a language that I cannot understand. Surprisingly though, I think I started to get the hang of it. Basically, everybody gets a turn to move around the board and then take some action to help maintain the health and wellness of your Tamagotchi, like feeding them, giving them medicine, or cleaning up their excrement. Really now. There's also mini games, which I only know how to play by picking up on the context, and I wasn't too bad at it, all things considered. I'd say it reminds me of Mario Party, but what's funny about that is that there was no Mario Party when this game came out. That, and the developers of this game were Bandai Namco, and Hudson Soft, which is the company that would make Mario Party. So, is it possible that this game served partially as the groundwork for Mario Party? because that would be an interesting piece of trivia. Yoshi's Story for the Nintendo 64. I think during this exciting time of 3D video games, some people were concerned that 2D platformers were going to be abandoned outright, as though they were a fundamentally obsolete technology. But thankfully, there were still a lot of game developers at this time that understood that the genre had a lot to offer, and from that perspective, this is a very important game for maintaining that rich legacy and attempting to build on it. This is a follow-up to Yoshi's Island, which itself was a sequel to Super Mario World. So, you could almost call this game Super Mario World 3, but somebody would probably hit you. Mario is not actually seen in this game, but they do reference him on numerous occasions, and you can see Luigi mentioned in the newspaper dimension. Either way, it's Yoshi, who is undeniably a Mario character. So even without that stuff, it counts. The story tells of the super happy tree, which keeps the inhabitants of Yoshi Island perpetually cheerful. Super happy tree? Who made this game? Bob Ross? Baby Bowser steals the super happy tree, making the land really sad, so six newborn baby Yoshis embark on a quest to restore the tree and get their happiness back. Yeah, that's right, it's a quest to overcome depression. The game has these extremely super happy overtones that are almost overwhelming, like Kirby but without the freaky twist villains. The story is very clearly geared towards little babies, but a really small voice in my head wonders if it's secretly very profound. Like it's a commentary on humans' desperate tendency towards living in constant, unending euphoria and seeking out any stimulus they can. The first thing you're gonna notice about this game is the visuals. Similarly to Yoshi's Island, the game is like a playable pop-up storybook, except now with far more detail than was previously possible. The textures and environments are incredible. They've really captured that feeling of walking around in a storybook even more so than its predecessor, and it's one of a small small handful of N64 titles that runs at a perfect, unwavering 60 FPS. The N64 was not known for 2D platformers, certainly not sprite-based ones. They did exist, but it was not the go-to approach. So for that alone, Yoshi's story is at least a little bit special. Nintendo opted once again for the Donkey Kong Country technique, except this time they can hold more sprite data than they ever could on the Super Nintendo, allowing animations to be far more smooth and varied than ever before. This is not just a Super Nintendo game injected with 64-bit steroids, this is a very clean break from anything on that console. There is a ridiculous amount of detail, with Yoshi having all kinds of different idle animations depending on the situation, there are different animations depending on how fast he's running, there's this front facing sprite for the rolling log section and it's terrifying, you have this really pretty shimmering water effect and these incredible lighting effects that add a remarkable 3D-esque sense of atmosphere and mood to this 2D game. 
It's almost like it's breaking the barrier between dimensions sometimes. The second thing you're gonna notice is Yoshi's voice. This is the first game to feature what we now recognize as Yoshi's voice as performed by longtime Nintendo composer Kazumi Totaka. Super Nintendo nerds may recognize the name from the famous Totaka's song easter egg that was hidden in several of the games in his repertoire. Previous titles had Yoshi doing this. After 25 years, I still cannot understand how I'm supposed to interpret that noise. Half of the fun of this game is listening to the funny Yoshi voices as they ground pound enemies and chow down on a very unhealthy quantity of grapes and watermelons. <laughs> Remember kids, even fruits and vegetables can be unhealthy if you eat too many of them. A lot of voice clips from this game would be reused in future titles and it would serve as the basis of Yoshi's voice for the rest of history. Lasso! But then there's the gameplay, this is where things get weird. The core mechanics are pretty intuitive, you run and jump and hover and throw eggs much like its predecessor, no babysitting in this game which is a nice change of pace. Instead you have a health bar in the form of a happy flower with 8 petals and getting health back is pretty easy, you just eat stuff. The game has a huge emphasis on environmental puzzle solving and interactive whimsical set pieces. You are gonna see some very funky things in this game. Even more so than regular Mario, there is a psychedelic whimsy to Yoshi's story that few other games can match. Unlike Yoshi's Island where you have to get to the end of the level, Yoshi's story is about eating fruit to make yourself happy. Yeah, really. You only complete a level once you get 30 separate pieces of fruit. They can be any fruit in any order, just eat 30 and the level is done. And if you've been paying attention, you'll notice that there's a lot of fruit lying all over the place. So one would think that this would make the game very easy. And yeah, it is. Except for this one level that killed me four times in a row because the collision is terrible and this level with the cheap cheap that one shots you. I guess you could call that a cheap shot. If you're into the high score thing, you can hunt down these secret big heart collectibles and also optimize your points by getting the same kinds of fruits several times in a row. In particular, the randomly decided lucky fruits that give you 8 points each. Doing so gives you a multiplier that gets bigger with each additional fruit. So serious Yoshi story men are gonna be doing this a lot and then throw their controller out the window when they eat the wrong fruit because the game put a bunch of them together like an asshole. There's also the melons, of which there are 30 on every map, meaning that you can melon max which gets you big money. If you get 6 of the same fruit in a row, the game gives you an invincibility item that lets you turn shy guys into lucky fruit. So people looking for the max score can strategically map out areas such that they get the power up at the optimal time. And that's where Yoshi's Story is at its most fun. Going for the highest score turns Yoshi's Story into a completely different video game with a surprising amount of strategy and forethought. The casual approach is a cozy game for kids. The high score approach is the end of the world and you will be killed. There are six chapters, each with a handful of levels, except you only need to beat one level to complete a chapter. Depending on which levels you chose, the story unfolds slightly differently at the end, which is a neat idea. Not that there are a massive number of narrative permutations in this game, but it's more of a story than you would expect. Unlike its predecessor, Yoshi's Story is not a unanimously acclaimed masterpiece. Miyamoto didn't direct this game as he did for Yoshi's Island, and I don't know if that's the reason or not, but I think it might explain a couple of things. The game itself is usually not very challenging, except for some very specific and incidental parts that make me want to eat tin foil, and the cutesy overtones can quickly become overbearing. It also sucks that you don't get 1-ups in this game, you get 6 Yoshis and that's it for the entire game, unless you find some super duper secret Yoshi. 
For a game this short and relatively easy, it might not sound like a major problem until you get to the levels with bottomless pits and these stupid bastard bouncy things that chuck you all over the place. From a purely gameplay perspective, Yoshi's story is nowhere near the level of Yoshi's Island. This game often feels more like an experimental title made by one of Nintendo's B teams, which is weird because it actually had a lot of veteran Nintendo talent running the show. People like Takashi Tezuka, Hideki Kano, and Katsuya Eguchi. I guess when you do a lot of good work, you're entitled to a couple of mulligans here and there, so even if this game was flat out awful, I'd forgive them. As a whole, the game is nowhere near awful, but it is frustrating. You have these cumbersome ass puzzles where you have to swing on this pendulum and then there's this mini game which is f***ing terrible and feels like a 2007 rage game you'd play on new grounds like Quop. Look at this shit, I can't get past cause the bees are in the way so I have to sneak past with the boxes in hand except I can't do that cause they keep falling over. There are also times where it's not clear if there's a bottomless pit below you or another section of the level. This is a game with a lot of vertical space, so this kind of thing happens more often than it should. In a game that's very exploration heavy with a lot of secrets, this feels more like an oversight rather than a deliberate layer of challenge. The controls can also feel very sensitive and slippery in the worst of times. D-pad controls would have been a nice addition, it's a 2D platformer, so with the exception of some very specific situations, a control stick is often superfluous and ends up adding more vectors for error without providing any of the same advantages that it would in a 3D game. While the gameplay can be fun in the right moments, most of the heavy lifting in Yoshi's story is done by the phenomenal presentation, especially the soundtrack. There is a surprising amount of musical variety in this game. Most songs fall back on one recurring motif, but it's remarkable just how much mileage they got out of it. Yo, yo, Yoshi flies out of left field. The game was faked and it just got real. This confrontation ain't no conversation if you feel. That line ain't mine, Eminem I did steal. Yoshi. 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 Bam, 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 bam. I realize I've been pretty mean to this game, but I did actually enjoy it. Yoshi's Story is absolutely not a bad video game, although considering this is episode 5, I have been spoiled by games that are actually great, like Hotel Mario. I do think this serves as the foundation for something truly great though, and who knows, maybe there exists a much brighter future for Yoshi platformers. 1998. Ah, very good year. Year of games like Metal Gear Solid, Ocarina of Time, Banjo-Kazooie, Half-Life, and a little console called the Game Boy Color. By this time, the original Game Boy was somehow still going strong despite having some very beefy competition. But by the late 90s, a handheld console that could only do games in a weird greenish-gray hue seemed a little bit quaint. So that's when Nintendo releases the Game Boy Color, a revision of the Game Boy with one purpose colors. This machine was backwards compatible with all available Game Boy titles and it was able to retroactively add simple color palettes to them, but also developed its own exclusive library of games that were designed from the get-go to be in color. Still no backlight on this thing, so that sucked, but it was still nice to be able to see the color red on a portable machine that wasn't the Virtual Boy. Many of the earliest titles for the Game Boy Color were remasters of existing Game Boy titles now with a full and robust color palette, and there is perhaps no game more perfect to remaster than Tetris, complete with Mario cameos and all. This is a remarkable conversion, not just because of the visuals, but there are new features as well, like the versus CPU mode, which is a lot of fun when the game actually lets you win. Objectively, this is probably even better than the original, whether it's less iconic or not. But in the end, it's still Tetris. So if you like Tetris, then you like Tetris. Which this is. They also remade Game & Watch Gallery 2 in color, giving it some much appreciated vibrancy that heightens the whimsy of it all. Although, I am a little perplexed by the color palettes. I eat eggs so often in my life that my friends call me Eggman, and never once have I seen an egg that was pink. Check it out, when it burns, it looks like a record. 
Peach, be careful, that's vintage. No! Up next, we got Wrecking Crew 98 for the Super Famicom, a Japan-only sequel to the original Wrecking Crew that came out over a decade previously. I would imagine the relative lack of public consciousness of Wrecking Crew, combined with the relative irrelevance of the Super Nintendo, had a lot to do with the decision not to release it overseas. It's kind of sad, though, because this is actually a pretty fun spin on the concept. The game is entirely in Japanese, so I cannot read the instructions or the story, but what I've discovered is that the most intuitive and easy to understand gameplay systems are kind of able to explain themselves without any reliance on words whatsoever. And once I actually sunk my teeth into the game, I figured out pretty quickly how it all worked. Unlike the original Wrecking Crew where you just destroy everything in sight, this is more like a tile matching puzzle game with Wrecking Crew serving as the basis for the puzzle mechanism. You destroy individual tiles to make other tiles drop, and if three or more touch each other in a row or column, they disintegrate and cause trouble for the other player. I gotta be honest, this one is actually really fun. Maybe they should bring this game back. Wrecking Crew 99, make it a battle royale. Mario's next appearance, supposedly, was in a game called Famicom Detective Club, The Girl Who Stands Behind specifically the remade version for the Super Famicom. Like a couple of the games we've spoken about, this game has nothing at all to do with Mario, but he does make some kind of appearance, at least according to that big Wikipedia list. I can't figure out what specifically it's referring to, but there's a possibility that it's referring to the mock Famicom disk system startup at the beginning. A game like this might therefore seem outside of the scope of the series, but I think it's worth mentioning at least briefly, because it is a historically significant significant game enough to get a remake on the Switch. And I talked about a Tamagotchi game a second ago, right? That, and I don't know if I'll ever get another good opportunity to talk about it. This particular game is the second in the Famicom Detective Club series which started out on the Famicom Disk System. These are text-based adventure games that were only released in Japan, and since the text is the core of the game, it's kind of unplayable without knowing the language, but at least it's remarkably cinematic. If you really want to go to the trouble, you can fumble your way through using one of those phone apps that automatically translates whatever text you saw with your camera but that's a very cumbersome way to play it. People who have played it themselves are really into it, and it was considered one of the best Super Famicom games in some circles, even to the point that it got numerous fan translations. They were begging to be officially localized, which is probably why they were remade. Mother 3 is next, right? Mario no Photopi. This is another Japan exclusive. The simplest way to describe it is as a sequel to Mario Paint. This is a very weird game. It was initially intended to have support for the upcoming 64DD, but its release was pushed too far back, so they opted for something else. The cartridge for this game was very unconventional. It had a slot on top of it for a smart media storage card, and if you've never heard of smart media, that's because the format is now completely obsolete and doesn't really exist anymore. But if you remember what an SD card is, it's basically an earlier version of that. Because of this, the game's functionality is very limited under normal circumstances, with the only real feature being this lame minigame where you have to solve this tile puzzle thing. You also got this theme song, which is possibly the worst shit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Ordinarily, I would just move on at this point, but this is where my unique experience comes in. If you've been watching me for a long time, you probably know that my passion is ROM hacks, and lo and behold, there actually is a ROM hack of this game to make it run properly. It was made by Skellix, better known as the creator of Star Road. No matter what I do, I can never escape ROM hacks. The actual paint function has a remarkable number of features like a full RGB color picker and image layers. This is a lot more feature rich than the Super Nintendo game, granted it's nowhere near as intuitive. A lot of that could be because I can't read the instructions, but I mean, it took me 15 minutes just to figure out how to draw squiggles with a goddamn pencil tool. So about on par with GIMP I'd say.
Ever since the first Mario Party came out on the Nintendo 64, the series has been a must for Nintendo consoles, which is not an exaggeration. If there's a Nintendo console after the Nintendo 64, it has Mario Party. Some of them have several titles. Much like the Tamagotchi game I spoke about earlier, this is a virtual board game thing where you and three other players or CPUs move around the board, getting money and buying stars. It was also by the same developer, so I don't think it's a stretch to assume they borrowed some DNA. This is a virtual board game where everybody rolls a die that goes up to 10 and then moves that number of spaces. At the end of everybody's turn, they all play a mini game where the winner or winners get extra cash to spend on the board and that's where the real game happens. The goal is to step on a space that lets you buy a star for 20 coins and at the end the one with the most stars is the winner. Sounds fair, right? Well, no. It's not even remotely fair. This is a board game, so an element of random chance is fundamental to the experience, and it is very easy to go from being on top of the world one minute to just have it all ripped out of your hands at a moment's notice. You see, every single time a star is purchased, the star space moves to some other part of the board. So let's say your entire plan in the immediate future revolved around trying to reach one specific space, and then another player gets there first, so your entire plan is now garbage and you have to start from square zero. I feel like I'm always hearing people talk about how much fun this game is, how funny it is, and all their great memories of it, and I feel like I'm going crazy because that has never been my experience. To me, Mario Party is an unbelievably bad video game, straight up, it is terrible, this is garbage, just completely garbage. If you play it single player, Mario Party is absolutely a multiplayer game first, it's right in the title. How are you gonna party with a CPU? You can't do it. In multiplayer, when some bullshit happens, it's funny, it's a memory that you and whoever you are playing with will be laughing about for years. It turns into an inside joke, like Donkey Kong the Tug War f***er or something like that. But when you're playing against CPUs, it is not funny at all. It will make you miserable, it will make you angry, it'll make you depressed, and it will hurt you. Let me summarize my experience with Mario Party in one single story. I was playing on this map, the DK Jungle map. It was about halfway through the round and I was having an unbelievably bad run. Two other CPUs had stars already and I was just desperately hoping for some stupid cosmic variable flexibility to perfectly align to give me some kind of a win. That's when Toad puts the next star three spaces in front of me so I'd have divs on the next turn. It was at this point that I was like, ooh, alright, maybe I can salvage this. That's when Luigi, that mother lands on a Bowser space, which of course resulted in an impromptu 3v1 tug of war where I lost, even though I was rotating that stick like it was a life or death situation. <laughs> And the punishment for losing, of course, was having 20 coins confiscated from me. So when it got back to my turn, I could no longer afford the star. So the game putting the star right in front of me, that was pointless. That was just done to play with my emotions. Every single person who makes Mario Party belongs in hell. This game is so evil, in fact, that players who got super into the game actually got blisters on their hand from rotating the control stick for the Tug War minigame. They even threatened lawsuits, which never actually went to court, but they did offer protective gloves to people who played the game. The first Mario Party was never brought to the Wii or Wii U's virtual console, and it's generally accepted that this is the reason. But you can play it on the Switch Online service right now. I guess they stopped caring. One thing that's kind of funny is the graphics. The character models look really wonky, even for a Nintendo 64 title. Check out Mario's model in 64. Not the best thing in the world, but it still looks alright. And you look at his Mario Party model where he is a bowling ball with noodle arms. And if you think that's funny, what about the voices? I mean, Luigi sounds insane. Yeah! This game uses the Japanese sound bites for Luigi and Wario, despite the fact that Charles Martinet had voices for them by this time. Maybe it was just easier that way, although it is worth noting that some lines were changed in localization. Most notably, in the Japanese version, Wario says, Oh my god! Oh my god! They should have kept that in, to be honest. Like I said, the visuals are not so great, with the exception of some occasionally good lighting effects, but at least the music is kind of funny sometimes. So, bottom line, Mario Party is a great game to play with your friends, 
but computers are not your friends. Some may remember the Nintendo 64 era as the period where Nintendo began to fall short. But however you feel about the N64, there is no question that Mario still remained an uncompromisingly strong presence and enjoyed tremendous success on many fronts. Some of the most memorable series got their start here, including some games that we have yet to speak about. Not to mention the Game Boy Color was backing them up. There were fewer games in this episode than the previous ones, but I had a lot more to say about them. And really, that is where I have the most fun. There is no higher compliment I can give to a video game than to talk about it for more than one minute. And as we continue to track Mario through history, we're gonna be seeing a lot more of those types of games. And let me tell you, I got a lot to say in the next episode, and if you've been following the list, you know exactly what I mean. Until then, Thank you so much for watching my video.